Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where a cop tries to chase down a meteor. Our next Reddit post is from Failwolf. I worked as a dispatcher for a small town police department out west. There was always a bit of a struggle with our patrol sergeant, who looked down his nose at dispatch, always trying to micromanage our department and bully our dispatch sergeant. One day, he discovered that dispatchers were handling small routine matters, such as answering questions from the public and handling other minor issues that didn't require a police response. He was outraged! He stomped around the station for a bit, then issued a memo. It began with a condescending essay about how dispatchers weren't qualified to answer questions or handle minor issues, because only fully trained police officers were capable of such weighty matters. He then issued a directive that any officer would be sent on any call received from the public, no matter what it was. Our dispatch sergeant just smiled and told us to follow the directive because she was sure that it wouldn't last long. As luck would have it, I was on duty that very night, and I guess I was lucky because the call came in. Then another, then another. Apparently, a rather bright meteor had gone harmlessly over the town at a fairly low altitude. It was pretty spectacular, really, and it was obvious what it was. My phone rang off the hook, with most people just wanting to ask if anyone thought that it had fallen to earth near town. This wasn't really an issue for the town police, but, well, the boss did say to send police no matter what the issue was, so... The radio traffic went along these lines. Unit 28, stand by for traffic. 28, this will be an attempt to locate. Advise when ready to copy. 28, go. Be advised, this will be a greenish glowing object, last seen at an estimated altitude of 3,500 feet, traveling in a northwesterly direction at approximately <laughs> 1,500 miles per hour. If located, stop and identify occupants. 10-9? The patrol sergeant, shouting into his mic from the radio at home, Did you get a call on this? Affirmative, the station has received multiple calls, and as per your directive, an officer has been dispatched. What followed was the sound of a radio being slammed onto a desk. The next morning, the issue was compounded a bit, because the responding officer also followed his directive and filed an official report, noting, <laughs> noting that the object had fled our jurisdiction before contact could be made, and he recommended the matter be referred to the FBI for further investigation because he had reason to believe the object had crossed state lines. Our captain and chief were laughing to tears and our detective volunteered to go assist the FBI investigation, theorizing that it had gone to Vegas. The captain issued a new memo, stating that dispatchers were to have full discretion in handling calls and minor matters for the public. I'm kind of surprised the cop wasn't like, Responding officer attempted to issue a speeding ticket, as 1500 miles per hour is grossly over the speed limit of 60 miles per hour, but unfortunately, responding officer was not able to catch up. Our next Reddit post is from Tornado Grill. I worked in an office supply store for a while in my late 20s while finishing college. I worked mostly with younger college students, and I began training other employees and running the front end of the store. Our amazing manager took a better position elsewhere, and we were gifted a manager who was absolutely horrible. Let's call her Jean. She treated us so poorly that we went from over 20 employees to just 7 in the first couple months of her taking reign. Jean was absolutely horrible, but I stood up for myself and the few remaining employees and openly expressed my disdain for her while remaining completely professional on paper. And here come annual evaluations. Jean gives me an absolutely horrible review. Since our raises were performance-based, I didn't get a raise. I refused to sign off and I contested my evaluation, which really pissed her off. Since we only had seven employees, we were desperately hiring. Within a week or two, she had hired a few people and scheduled me to train them. So I did what any rational person who was about to quit would do. I formally asked HR for retraining due to my perceived incompetence and made it clear that I was no longer comfortable training new hires. I simultaneously refused to do any work outside of my minimal assigned responsibilities, and I also began moving really slowly. I made myself as incompetent as possible, refusing to answer any customer questions via phone and forwarding all calls to Jean. 
I paid her to help for stupid things, intentionally screwed up the cash register, and requested policies for irrelevant operations. I stopped meeting quotas, and when I coached, I would play dumb and pretend like I was trying my hardest. <laughs> Most importantly, I started correcting customers and contractors whenever they called my boss Jean and I would insist that her name was Jan. Whenever she questioned me, I said, I'm sorry, I just can't pronounce your name well, Jan, which infuriated her. Of course, Jean was also pissed that she had to train the new employees herself. I filed a formal complaint with HR about my lack of retraining every week until they fired me. I had another job lined up, but I filed an unemployment claim anyway just to leave some extra work for Jan. Petty bonus. I never told Jean that my mom was the store's biggest buyer at the time, and she had been one of the top three clients since forever. Well, guess who took her business to a competitor? My very non-confrontational mother actually went into the store to request that her account be closed, knowing that contract accounts have to be closed by the store manager. Jean asked, Why are you closing your account? My mother replied, I'm OP's mom. Jean got canned about a year later, and I like to think that I was a little match that lit that fire. You know what I don't understand is like, if you're the owner of a store or the general manager or whatever, and everything's working fine, your manager leaves, and you bring in your new manager, and within months of bringing in this new manager, you go from 20 employees to 7. What kind of idiot is like, well, keep up the good work, new manager. I'm sure you're doing a great job. Wouldn't you just immediately fire the new manager and then temporarily step in as the manager yourself until you got things fixed? Our next Reddit post is from TB Ross. I work for a very large corporation in the IT department. I worked my way up from first level support to the back office team, aka the escalation team, like second level but slightly above them. I essentially fix critical issues that are escalated up from the first and second level. On the back office team, we're a team of six people, and we all have certain areas that we specialize in, but are cross-trained in all areas to help cover when people go on vacation or call in sick. My area of expertise is a network team, and another area that I can't say, otherwise it'll give away the company that I work for. But to put it into perspective, the company that I work for owns several hundred retail locations from coast to coast in the USA. Because we're in the last fiscal quarter of the year, the budget is tightening. Not because the company is low on money, but because all the upper management wants to stay within a certain range so they can get their bonuses for saving the company money. So, a very strict no overtime policy was implemented. At first, I didn't think anything of it because I preferred to work my 40 hours a week and spend time with my family. But there was a particular incident this past Friday that fueled my malicious compliance on Saturday. On that Friday, we had one guy off on paid time off and a couple of call-ins sick, which left just myself and another guy working. We'll call him Matt. Matt worked the opening shift, and I worked the later shift to cover the West Coast. Because it was just the two of us, we were pretty busy. As the day wore on and we were closer to Matt's quitting time, we were slammed. We had four locations where their network had gone down, and I was dealing with two techs on site, and I was trying to guide them to set up new equipment. When 5 p.m. rolled around, Matt asked management if he could stay an extra 30 minutes to help me out. Management gave a very quick and hard no and reminded us of the no overtime policy. So Matt had to leave at his scheduled time and leave me with a huge mess to try to fix. I worked the rest of the night on back-to-back -back issues and was able to get them sorted out before it was my quitting time. However, I had to work through my break. This is when I decided that I wouldn't overextend myself and I would follow the new policy. The next day is when the malicious compliance started. I was working the Saturday shift, and since Saturdays are slower, just two of us were scheduled. Well, on this particular Saturday, the guy that I was supposed to work with called in, and because no overtime was allowed, they couldn't call in another person to help me out. As the day wore on, I was increasingly busy being the only back office person working. During the last hour of my shift, something broke on the server side and dozens of stores weren't able to perform transactions or take credit card payments. I worked hard to resolve it, but the end of my shift was nearing. Cue malicious compliance. The end of my shift hit and I made zero strides in fixing the issue. Since we were on a strict no overtime policy, I clocked out and left. This left dozens of stores down and unable to make money. 
I forwarded the issue to the on-call supervisor, but they rarely check anything over the weekend, so the issue went untouched until Sunday afternoon when management finally saw my reports and emails from Saturday afternoon. The company lost countless dollars in sales, probably in the six-figure range at least. My phone was blowing up all day Sunday as management tried to get further details from me. But, because of the no overtime policy, I couldn't answer the phone because that would require me to log hours and that would be overtime. So, I simply showed them the no overtime policy emails that they sent out every week for the past few weeks. They quietly dismissed me back to work knowing they had messed up and had caused this. So, not paying me a few hours of overtime cost the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh no, OP! How will upper management ever get their bonuses with this kind of terrible mistake? Our next Reddit post is from New Bromance. So, I work in an off license. And for all those non UK people out there, that basically means a liquor store or convenience store. Most of my job is selling alcohol, but we're also a UPS drop off point. People can collect and send UPS packages from here. If a parcel is going abroad, it needs three commercial invoices attached. One for UK Customs, one for UPS, and one for American Customs when it arrives. This system has been in place since Brexit. Before then, you only needed one copy, but for reasons I don't understand, leaving Europe cocked this all up and now we have to do it this way. The result is the instructions of sending a parcel abroad online are a bit confusing. So often, people turn up without all three invoices and I have to tell them that it won't be accepted. 90% of customers accept this once it's explained. Some grumble and then accept it, but this one specific customer was having none of it. For whatever reason, she just plainly didn't believe me, even when I showed her the poster behind me literally explaining that it needed three invoices. Whatever she had read online said that just one invoice would be fine, and she wouldn't accept some lowly shop worker telling her otherwise. Eventually, I gave up explaining that it was just going to get stuck in customs, and when she again demanded that I accept the parcel, I replied, Okay, but again, I have to warn you, this won't make it to America. She rolled her eyes, and I gave her the receipt. Later that day, when UPS came to collect today's parcels, me and the driver had a good laugh about the parcel, and he happily took it. One week later, she was back in my shop complaining that the parcel hadn't made it to America, and what am I going to do about it? At this point, it's out of my hands. I'm just a drop-off point, so I gave her the UPS customer service number and tell her she'll have to take it up with them. She tells me she's going to make a complaint about me as well, apparently. I don't care, I don't work for UPS. Two weeks later, she's back in the shop with the same parcel to send it out again. It now has three invoices attached correctly. My customer service voice is agonizingly sweet as I accept that parcel. My have a nice day afterwards must have been the most insincere goodbye anyone has ever uttered. Okay, I don't really follow UK stuff. I don't fully understand what Brexit is or why people do it, but every time I read anything about Brexit, it always seems like the dumbest, worst decision that the UK could have ever made. So I don't understand why you guys don't just like pre-unex it. Prepare for pre-entry? I, I don't know, man. Our next Reddit post is from Independent Grape. My HOA recently changed the rules limiting the amount of vehicles allowed in my driveway. I collect cars, all of which run, drive, are registered and insured, and my household also has four licensed drivers. When I moved in, the rules stated, only one Class C vehicle allowed per driveway. Well, that was fine by me, since Class C vehicles don't exist. Class C vehicles weren't defined in the HOA rules either. I assume that whoever wrote that rule assumed that since they had a Class C license, then standard cars and trucks must be Class C. So I moved in, and after stuffing two cars, four motorcycles, and a camper in my garage, I placed five vehicles in my driveway. The HOA letter came. I was quickly able to deflate them after asking them for their legal definition of a Class C vehicle. I paid no fines. Fast forward about a year and the HOA proposed a rule change. The rule now stated, three vehicles per driveway maximum. Since three is more than one and people lack critical thinking skills, it was passed with over 85% support. Fine, three vehicles it is. 
I did some digging, and I found out the streets in my HOA were turned over to the city, probably in an effort to avoid having to foot the maintenance bill, I'm sure. And as such, the HOA had no authority to stop people from parking on a public street. So I moved two vehicles to my very narrow street, one in front of my house and one directly across the street in front of my neighbor's house. Now, the only vehicles that could safely drive past my home were motorcycles and that one guy with a smart car. It was glorious. My street is a main artery into and out of the neighborhood. Lots of U-turns and backtracking for folks to get home or to work. They're the ones who did the rest of the work for me. Complaints and calls to the HOA president resulted in another rule change vote. Now, my driveway is open to any amount of legally registered vehicles. It currently fits nine, so I guess I need more cars. <laughs> Down in the comments, we have this post from Lufa of Doom. My HOA has a rule that you can only have eight pet legs in your home. So two normal cats or two normal dogs, or I guess two three-legged quadrupeds and one bird, one quadruped and two birds, eight one-legged birds, and an infinite number of snakes. You gotta be careful with that, because if you have one spider, you're at your limit, or if you have one centipede, then they're gonna kick you out of your house. That was our slash malicious compliance, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button, because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.